Welcome to this week's Archaeology News, where I discuss the latest and most interesting stories to come out of the world of ancient history. My headline story this week is about a new study into Cyprus's extensive Bronze Age trade network that stretched all across the Mediterranean and possibly beyond. I also discuss the recent discovery of a submerged Neolithic road in Croatia, the discovery of a 6,000-year-old settlement in Corsica, and a study into what we can learn about Bronze Age movements of people based on their sourcing of volcanic rocks for the creation of tools. New study in Cyprus proves extensive Bronze Age trade network. A new study published in the journal Science Direct details past fieldwork at and current analysis of artefacts from the late Bronze Age harbour city now called Hala Sultan Teke in Cyprus. Up until recently, evidence had been found in Cyprus for interregional trade. However, this was limited in its scope. This latest study contributes much more evidence for long-distance exchange between the 15th and 12th centuries BCE. Past geophysical surveys have revealed numerous man-made structures at the site and have enabled archaeologists to estimate a size of around 25 hectares for the original city, which was divided into four quarters. It appears the centre of the city was enclosed by a wall and a moat. Many burial sites and offering pits have also been found using magnetometer surveys. Previous digs at the site had uncovered Cypriot ceramics, including the white pented pendant line style. They had uncovered evidence for the large-scale production of copper and evidence for the manufacture of purple dyed textiles. This photograph shows copper slag and ore excavated from City Quarter 1, one of the pieces of evidence that points towards copper production. In the ancient world, textiles were dyed purple using mucus from the murex snail, so the discovery of murex shells and basins containing purple dye have provided archaeologists with evidence that this activity was carried out there. Imported pottery and artefacts have also been uncovered in the past, and they mostly originated from the Minoan and Mycenaean civilizations, palatial cultures that flourished during the time Hala Sultan Teke was inhabited. In this photograph, the vessels at the top are Mycenaean and the ones at the bottom are Minoan. You may remember from my previous videos that the Minoan culture was largely centered on Crete before becoming gradually replaced by the Mycenaeans who came from elsewhere in the Aegean and spoke an Indo-European language. During the recent project, pottery experts separated ceramic wares into two categories, those that were locally produced and those that were imported. Scientific evaluations, including petrography, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, and neutron activation analysis were then carried out on some of the imported ceramics. These evaluations found that many ceramics originated in the Levant, such as this lentoid flask dating to the 13th century BCE. A large amount of red lustrous wheel-made ware was also analysed, which was found to have originated in Anatolia and comprises several different types of vessels, including spindle bottles, lentoid flasks, jugs, craters and platters. Black burnished bowls were also discovered which are similar to those that were produced by the Nuragic culture of Sardinia. So already at this point you can see that imports came from all over the Mediterranean. Faience and glass objects were also excavated during the most recent dig season and included a scarab with a green surface, a blue scepter bearing the cartouche of Haremheb and pendants depicting the Egyptian god Bess. So it's obviously quite possible that these artifacts originated in Egypt or were produced locally based on foreign cultural influence. A long violin bow fibula, one of the largest to be excavated in the eastern Mediterranean, is strikingly similar to contemporary artefacts from the Italian peninsula, specifically those found in Campestrian, Cavallo Morto and Torre Modillo. It's not clear where silver and gold objects came from since such metals were often recycled and re-alloyed. The researchers were however able to draw certain conclusions about them based on their designs and the production techniques used to create them. It's likely that the silver was imported since there are no large sources in Cyprus. Possible origins include Greece, Anatolia and maybe even Italy, Spain, the Balkans and Western Europe. 
One silver bowl was found which was etched with a Canaanite inscription stating the name of the owner. It may have been imported from Canaan or may have been produced in Cyprus by a Canaanite worker. 104 objects alloyed with gold were found. These are mostly jewellery and include Egyptian scarabs. Most of the gold material was probably mined in Nubia and Upper Egypt. Jewellery was found which is made from high quality lapis lazuli. The closest sources for this rock are Afghanistan and Italy. However, the latter is not good quality. So it's most likely the lapis lazuli used for this jewellery came from Afghanistan. Beads and pendants made of carnelian were also excavated. And although there are a few sources of carnelian in Egypt, Anatolia and the Arabian Peninsula, the researchers think it's quite possible it came all the way from India. 22 cylinder stones made of hematite, chlorite and steatite were produced both locally as well as in the northern Levant and Mesopotamia. So what the researchers conclude is that as a protected harbour, Hala Sultan Teke would have been in an advantageous situation to position itself as a trading hub. The quality of its imported merchandise shows that this was indeed the case. However, this meant it also needed to have high quality products for export as well. In the past, researchers found plenty of evidence for the large-scale production of copper and purple dyed textiles, and they've also found a lot of late Bronze Age Cypriot pottery around the Mediterranean and further afield, which means a surplus was produced for export. So the evidence is clear. Hala Sultan Teke was an immensely important import and export hub during the late Bronze Age and may even have traded as far away as India and Western Europe. Submerged Neolithic Road Discovered in Croatia Whilst investigating the submerged Neolithic site of Solin, close to the island of Korkula in Croatia, archaeologists have discovered an ancient road dating back around 7,000 years. The feature was found at a depth of 5 metres, covered in sea mud, and consists of stacked stones forming a 4 metre wide passage. This would have connected the artificially created Neolithic island of Solin with Korkula. The research is a collaboration between Dubrovnik Museums, the Museum of the City of Castella, the University of Zadar and the City Museum of Korkula. Solim was first discovered by satellite images in 2021, before archaeologists went diving at the site and found stone walls which verified what could be seen from above. Radiocarbon dating carried out on preserved wood excavated from the site at the time dated the settlement to 4900 BCE. The team that discovered the ancient road also found a submerged site on the opposite side of the island, which is similar to Solim. There they uncovered blades, stone axes and other Neolithic artefacts. They are also carrying out research at a cave in the nearby town of Vela Luca that has seen multiple phases of occupation, including as far back as 19,000 years ago, as well as during the Neolithic, at the same time that Solim was inhabited. I've put a link to a YouTube video showing the excavation of the road in the description below. 6,000 year old settlement excavated on Corsica. Archaeologists excavating in Sota, Corsica, due to a construction project planned in the area, have found two Neolithic sites, one on top of the other. The first settlement dates back to the early 4th millennium BCE and is only partially preserved. Archaeologists found a structure housing the remains of an obsidian napping workshop. The second settlement is better preserved and was built over the top of the first one sometime in the 3rd millennium BCE. This later site comprised a terraced structure with granite walls as well as the remains of a roof, staircase and pathway. Two similar terraced structures were also found at the site. It's not clear what these terraced structures were used for, but it's possible they were for food storage or were workshops of some kind. Many artefacts and remains were found at the site, including burnt cattle teeth and skeletal remains, ceramics, flint, obsidian, quartz, arrowheads, polishers, axes, wheels and other tools. Researchers are continuing to study the finds. New study traces a Bronze Age people's movements via their volcanic grinding tools. In ancient times, volcanic rocks were desired as grinding tools due to their wear resistance and grinding capacity. If such rocks weren't local to a settlement, they needed to be brought from elsewhere. And it's these transportation activities that can help archaeologists trace the movements of ancient people. A recent study examined vesticulated lavas that make up final Bronze Age querns, mortars and pestles discovered at the site 
of Monte Croce Gaudia on the Italian peninsula. Since the settlement is built on a limestone landscape in the Marsh Umbria Apennines, the volcanic rocks must have come from further afield. Monte Croce Gaudia was built on a hilltop in the recent Bronze Age and became densely populated during the final Bronze Age between 1150 and 925 BCE. A petrologic analysis was carried out on artifacts from Monte Croce Gaudia to work out where the volcanic rocks had originated from. The results showed that the majority of the fragments had been sourced from the Shoshonite lavas of the Radicofani Volcanic Centre in the Tuscan Magmatic Province. The most likely route taken between Monte Croce Gardia and Radicofani, one where Bronze Age settlements have been found and where there are plenty of water sources, was around 140 kilometres in length and would have taken between 25 and 30 hours to walk. This suggests a well-coordinated effort to transport the volcanic rocks and also suggests relationships between the various settlements that would have been appropriate stop-off points on this travel corridor. That's it, just a couple of comments. When I initially read an article about Bronze Age Cyprus and its position as a trade hub, I wasn't surprised. When I did my Masters in Mediterranean Studies, a lot of the focus was on interconnectivity in the region. But when I read the full study, I was surprised by how far and wide this long distance trade appears to have been. Egypt, Afghanistan, India, Spain, and so many other locations were all involved with each other, whether directly or indirectly. And I find that simply amazing. It also makes me wonder just how much cultural exchange did take place in terms of belief systems, um, languages and fashions. Although neither the submerged road discovered in Croatia or the structures excavated in Corsica are megalithic, my main interest, they still give us some rather interesting information on the Neolithic period. I'm curious as to why, with all the land available, the Neolithic inhabitants of Croatia went to the effort to build an artificial island. I know that's not the only one from that time period, and in the later Iron Age, artificial islands called Cranogs were built all over Scotland, Ireland and Wales. I guess the most likely scenario is that they were easy to defend, but whatever they were for, just like megaliths, I assume the practical purpose must have outweighed the immense resources and effort required to build them and the causeways that linked with the mainland. The site in Corsica looks like it could have been a workshop in its later incarnation, just as in its earlier one. I didn't used to be so interested in tool making and those practical elements of ancient life, but the more experimental archaeology and recreations I watch, the more the subject fascinates me. To have such a well-preserved site in Corsica is fantastic, and I'll be interested to see what the further studies find out. The fact that the Bronze Age inhabitants of the Italian peninsula made what were clearly well-planned efforts to source highly resistant volcanic materials from more than 100 kilometers away shows just how resourceful the ancients were. Also, we know that in the Bronze Age, defensive structures became more prevalent and there are plenty of weapons dating to that period. So it's nice to think that in that 140 kilometer long corridor on the Italian peninsula, relations between villages were cordial enough to enable distant trade. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you to my patrons, channel members and super chatters for supporting my work. Please hit the like button, subscribe if you don't already, and I'll see you next time.